sharing an image that I took last year of my older TrustTube uh, GS uh, GSO telescope uh, of the Vell Nebula. Now, first of all, welcome to my backyard telescope journey. Today, we'll be looking at this Vail Nebula image uh, taken with my 12-inch telescope from my backyard. The Vail Nebula is a mesmerizing supernova located in the constellation of Cygnus, or the Swan. It's been one of the most spectacular and iconic objects in the night sky. It's a full-on complex with multiple nebulas, also referred to as the Cygnus Loop. The supernova was created uh, around 8,000 years ago, and it's remnants of a large explosion that is still visible today. And, um, the nebula is made out of swirling clouds of gas and dust, and it's illuminated by intense radiation from remnants of this specific supernova. Um, the image I capture is in hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. So the blue and purple hues represent oxygen gas, whilst the red and orange represent hydrogen gas. And this is around, uh, I would say, 20 hours of exposure time taken with a 12-inch uh, um, GS optic, GSO telescope or the TS uh, Trust Tube 12-inch uh, Richie Cretian that's been reduced by 0 0.8, 0 0.75 using the APM Super Reducer. The same telescope I used for the Rosette Nebula image that I shared. Um, it's an incredible target. I love the Cygnus loop targets, I've imaged the Network Nebula, Pickering's Triangle, the Veil Nebula, and so forth. So let's take a look at what I have. This data is a little bit older, so um, it looks good, uh, but I cannot reshoot it using the same equipment because I've sold that telescope. So now I have to take a look at a different telescope. So let's go to PixInsight and let's take a look at the equipment. This is the telescope, the focuser, the reducer, and the whole imaging tray. It's really big and quite heavy. I think in this configuration, it was north of 70 pounds or about 30-ish kilograms. Um, I could not load it on the mount myself if I had the imaging train. So what I would do is I would take the back off the adapter that the Asaro comes with, the flange, um, releases the focus so it doesn't affect the collimation. In this particular instance on the left, I was collimating it in my living room. So I had it uh, there for collimation. I collimated to the filter wheel, so I'd remove any possible tilt or collimation error like that. You can use a red filter and the red laser will go through it, like a hydrogen filter or a sulfur filter or luminance or red. It's fine. If you have a green laser, I would suggest the actual green filter. Now, this is the reducer that was put on there, the reducer corrector. It's very good. It's made by APM, designed by Massimo Riccardi, who also designed the Riccardi Honders telescopes. Very, very good equipment, very good glass. One of the best correctors out there that's made uh, as a mass-produced corrector. I would recommend the Model 2 for any larger telescope. It even works on some Cassegrain telescopes like the ACF and others by Mead. Um, it's M82, so it's very big. It has an open aperture of more than three inches, so it's enough for most sensors that are readily available to consumers. Most people don't even go higher than full frame. Uh, this is the actual telescope on the mount. I have a large dew shield because in Northern California there's a lot of humidity and I try to make sure that I remove as much as the unnecessary light uh, from neighbors' lights or anything and unnecessary do as I can. This telescope did not have any kind of hub or system to worm the secondary or primary, so I had to use that. Now you can uh, use aftermarket parts to worm the secondary, but it's not the best and it can move the secondary, so you have to reconomate everything. This telescope is pretty amazing optical-wise. Mechanically, it's you get what you pay for and I would say it needs reconomation every three to six months because the screws do not hold. And again, uh, it's much more affordable than professional level telescopes. It's probably a quarter of their price, so you have to you have to collimate it more often. But enough of that. Let's take a look at what data we have. So the hydrogen data looks stunning. The stars are pretty sharp. Now this telescope isn't perfect. It has a little bit of tilt in some of the corners. Now a lot of the modern CCD cameras don't come perfectly aligned. Their chips are very sensitive, so sometimes you have to adjust some of the tilt. Now this telescope, particularly with this camera, looks really good. Um, 
you can never get it perfectly. It's a pipe dream if you think you're going to get it 100%, unless you have a professional telescope and a lot of time on your hands. Um, I got it to where I could not see a difference between um, making adjustments. So I would take a couple of exposures, use the software called CCD Inspector to analyze the field of view. Not on this object, but somewhere where there's even stars and there's kind of even illumination for the software to measure. After I would do that, it would usually measure around one or two pixel deviation on collimation at one by one, which is more than enough. And probably under 10%, 5% tilt is enough. Again, you have to make sure that the field of view works for you. It could be two pixels, it could be one pixel. Zero is kind of hard to, to get with these cheaper Chinese, Taiwanese made uh, telescopes because again, uh, the mechanics aren't as good. But hydrogen looks really great for this target. The chroma filters really did an amazing job reducing any kind of um, halos, any kind of reflections. And this is also a tribute to the telescope. Um, I've had other telescopes that have really bright reflections on this target, specifically on this uh, star in the middle. This did really well. And for that, we have really good hydrogen data. Oxygen is surprisingly um, quite present in the veil nebula. Um, hydrogen and oxygen are some of the most dominant gases in the nebula. There's some sulfur, but it's pretty uh, weak. And you can do a standard Hubble nanoband palette, but it doesn't look anything like what I would what I would think would be a good image. And this is actually a very very good candidate to create a HOO image of hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen along with the crescent, um, the network nebula, and others. Pickering triangle. Maybe I'll do a video on that in the future. Um, I started with really good data. The field flattening was good. There's not a lot of gradients. Uh, it took me a while to get this data to be really workable, but it looks good. No, could I have collected more data? Sure, you can collect more data. That's fine. This is one by one, so it's 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 full resolution. I believe the exposures were 600 seconds each, and I think, again, around 20 hours of data. Also, let's look at the stack. The stack itself looks interesting. Uh, you'll notice a couple of things. There's some darker parts at the bottom. That's just, um, it's hard to do any kind of uh, dynamic background extraction or regular background extraction on this target just because the, there's a lot of nebulosity around. So I have to kind of find a way to uh, make that happen. Now, the, the, the image was really good. I did a synthetic luminous channel here because I really wanted the blue to pop. So I used the SHO. Um, there's an SHO script um, that allows you to create a, a synthetic luminous channel. In this case, it was oxygen 60%, uh, hydrogen 40%, which then makes sure that the final composition highlights the uh, oxygen wavelength a lot more. Uh, if you look at some of the veil images that are not as uh, dominant in blue, that was my intention. I don't really do this a lot. I think this is the first image I actually said I, I, I created a synthetic luminous channel on. But again, it was one intention then it was to create that beautiful, to, to make sure the oxygen stands out. You can image this with a regular DSLR, a regular one-shot color camera. Now, because it's not collecting emissions and it's collecting regular broadband light, this target is not going to be anywhere close, as, as visible, as bright. The stars will kind of make it very dim. So narrowband filters kind of make that swing that balance into pre looking at nebulosity, looking at gas, instead of like getting the stars to overpower everything. Um, I did some um, blur. I used the blood exterminator to kind of do the deconvolution on it. Um, it did a good job. It reduced the stars. Now, here's the thing. I try to do the same thing I always do, which is remove the stars, work on nebulosity, and bring it back in. But it doesn't work that well. <laughs> There's some issues with the stars. Maybe the telescope uh, itself uh, had too big, the uh, stars that were too big. Obviously the star in the middle, I was, uh, I was not surprised that it couldn't remove it. It's not easy. So what I had to do was kind of mask the stars, work on the nebulosity, come back, and then almost like uh, leave the stars untouched. So it was kind of the same thing, but it's a very deli de delicate balance and there's not much 
more stretching of the data that I could do. If you look at this image and I stretch it again, and I stretch it, double stretch it, you can see that it's starting to break down and there's not much. If your data is really good, even on this super stretch, it will still look decent. Now this doesn't look anywhere decent. So I, I didn't really want to push it. And again, I'm going to highlight this as well on the Stardust image. As you can see, it's a mess. And it's a mess because there's some issues with um, the data itself. Maybe the contrast wasn't as good. There's some issues with the flat field that are not visible at first. And there's slight gradients from the bottom center of the image going up. Um, and there's a weird line here. I don't know what this line is. I don't maybe there's a frame that got downloaded the wrong way usually sometimes that might happen but maybe it's just an obstruction i don't know what it is but i don't have the same telescope anymore and i would rather not find out so i did my best to kind of uh work around it and make it happen there's no color mixing needed because i don't need to um, you don't really color mix hydrogen oxygen oxygen images there's no point so let's look at the uh, the two images that I created. So this one is a little bit older. I've had it for a while. It won image of the day on Astro Bin when that was still possible and the community still gave awards to amateurs and not to the people that image from Chile. Um, it's a really good image. Now, what I didn't like about it is that it's still, the background is still a little bit bright and a little bit too saturated. So I like my bangos to be rather desaturated Again, there's a lot of nebulosity in there, and I'm going to do a video about Cygnus's loop taken with the astrograph, so you can probably see how much light there is there. Um, it's a good image. Again, it won image of the day from... not image of the day, excuse me. It's a top pick for the Vail Nebula on Astrobin, and it's, I still like it. But this is actually the one I like more. As you can see, I kind of toned down the background, I removed the saturation, and I made sure that the nebula is still the most important thing. Now, given that this image is taken from a pretty flat fluted sky like mine with different seeing conditions, weather conditions, lights and all sorts of stuff, this is not taken from a professional observatory in a dark place, this is taken from suburbia. So anytime my neighbor comes home or my neighbors come home, the lights light up the, uh, the street next to where I live. Um, everybody has floodlights for raccoons and skunk they don't care but they still have them so it's not the perfect place to image it's not like i would be in new mexico or somewhere where the skies are perfect so because of that my standards are much lower i am really happy with what i got here and uh, as for the final image i actually think it turned out well um if i was in a darker sky with better chance of beta seeing it would have been a lot better maybe the background wouldn't be as rough but given that I think it's the best veil image I've taken. Um, I've seen a lot of fantastic images taken with larger aperture telescopes like the 16 inch, 20 inch. I would love to do that, but I only had a 12 inch and I had to deal with it. Um, the telescope uh, itself was actually a very good telescope combination after I got it working. It took me a while to take special adapters. The reducer itself has a very small in focus distance, so it needed a lot of uh, machining to get it right, let's just say that. But again, the final result for this telescope that's I think about $4,000 new at that aperture is actually very impressive. Now, if you would have told me this is taken with, I don't know, a, a 12 or 14 inch CDK or IDK, I would probably believe it um, from the same kind of light pollution conditions. But given that the equipment wasn't professional grade like the other Officina Stellare I have, and the skies were in the best. This is what we have to deal with in our kind of industry and our hobby. The images can be much better, but in reality, you have to be happy with what you get because it's very hard to change uh, change the neighbors and, or the town or the, the city that you live in. Nobody cares about astronomy or our hobby. They, they care about having their yards lit up to prevent tests from coming in. So I think the image is really good. I think that I'll submit it to see if NASA likes it for an APOD or a notable image. Um, they've always been great about publishing my uh, images. And I have one more thing I wanted to say before uh, I end. 
the Rosette Nebula that I did a video on recently actually was published by NASA recently uh, on their notable images or their sky social media account and Instagram account. So I'm sorry, I forgot it, Robert and Jerry. If you ever watch my videos, I apologize. I respect everything you guys do and thank you for, for doing this kind of amateur prize that everybody is excited about. With that in mind, I'll leave you with this image and I'll see you in my next video. Um, if you have questions, let me know. If you have any comments, I'll be happy to, to respond. And uh, till next time.